Aloha, good evening. Welcome to the Japan Foundation's 50th year anniversary panel discussion titled as a strength in human capital pip pipelines for area studies, a global perspective. I'm Hideki Hara of the Japan Foundation. Uh, today's session is being live streamed and could serve as a perfect proof to my colleagues in Tokyo that my trip to Hawaii was all about business. It is our hope today's discussion with uh, such a renowned group of uh, panelists here, we invited from Europe, Southeast Asia, and the US will serve as a response from the Japan Foundation to the two pre uh, previous sessions at the previous AS conference, the death of Japan studies in 2019 and the virtual session in 2020, embracing the rebirth of the Japanese studies. I originally tried to title today's session as inoculation of the Japanese studies but the idea was turned down by my staff. Uh, what you saw on the screen before the opening today is a teaser clip of the, uh, the videos in the making about two giants of Japanese studies, namely Donald Keen and uh, Dr. Uh, Ezra Bogo. The full versions will be available on the Foundation's official YouTube channel as early as next month. And anybody is welcome to watch them or use them for non-commercial non purposes. As the videos are 30 minutes each and are available both in Japanese and English, we do encourage you to incorporate them uh, in your classroom as an orientation to the future Japan specialists you are teaching. Uh, before getting into the panels, we will have a few words from the president of the Japan Foundation, Ambassador Kazuyoshi Memoto, please. Thank you, Hara-san. Uh, my opening remarks will be a little bit more than a few words, but uh, I would like to keep it short as possible. Aloha, good evening, everybody. On this occasion of commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Japan Foundation, I would like to thank all of our partner organizations, including AAS, as well as our supporters and friends all over the world. A foundation can make a difference only in collaboration with its partners. We feel extremely fortunate to have been blessed with the organizations and individuals who share our commitments to bringing the world closer together over the last half century. To celebrate this memorial year, we are planning to organize quite a few events, including today's plenary session, which has been made possible by the generosity of former AS president, Dr. Christa Christian Yano and Executive Director Dr. Hilary Finchan Soon. I don't think any of us in this room need to be lectured on the importance of fostering the next generation of area studies specialists. In order to meet the ever changing demands of students and junior scholars, however, we need to constantly update our understanding of the field of Japan studies from both educational and research dimensions. We need to constantly learn from each other what works and what doesn't in both teaching and research. And most importantly, we need to do this on a global scale as no single country can provide all the opportunities and inspiration that are necessary for a new generation of studies, scholars. In today's plenary session, I personally look forward to learning best practices in education and research on Japan from the globally distinguished speakers. This will help me reflect on how we can take full advantage of our foundation's unique position as a hub for a global network of scholars on Japan and how we can continue to work with our wonderful partners and friends for another 50 years. The foundation will welcome this new era with new organizational structures. Japanese studies will have its own department and the various dialogue initiatives that have been promoted under different departments, including our three regional centers, 
namely Center for Global Partnership for Japan-US, Asia Center, and China Center, will be consolidated into one global partnership department. Both departments need ever more global approaches as the world cannot afford further regionalism. Last but not least, we feel very relieved that many of the Japan Foundation fellows who could not make their trips in the past few years have finally started to enter Japan this month. These individuals are assets not only for Japan, but for the entire world as they work beyond borders to understand people with different cultural backgrounds. I'm sure today's discussion will provide us with insights and good practices for fostering many more of such individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before getting into the panels, we'll have a, uh, no, no, no uh, let's, I actually, we read the same thing, but anyway. Uh, let's dive into the discussions. We have two panels today, one on education and uh, the other one on research. Now, obviously, these two uh, panels are not mutually exclusive and actually looking at the same agenda of identifying and developing a future kings or future Vogels uh, from two different perspectives. One from the entry point of the pipeline, which is actually the meaning, uh, which actually is uh, education, and the other from the other end of the uh, uh, the pipeline, research or their career path. So, for the first panel on education, we already gave the panelists these two uh, questions. Yes. Uh, as a vantage point of the discussions. And we have Dr. Alessio Patalano from King's College of London, uh, Dr. William Blitchitz from University of Rochester in person today. Uh, Dr. Fang Hai Lin from Vietnam National University couldn't come, but uh, we have a video presentation from her laying out the uh, conceptual framework of our discussion today. And uh, let's start uh, hearing that. Thank you. My name is Fan Hai Ling from Vietnam National University, Hanoi. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Japan Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk in this plenary session. Uh, given my limited experience and knowledge, I would like to share some thoughts on human resource development in area studies, especially on two questions, how to improve uh, the ability of area studies students to respond to jobs outside their countries and or outside of academia, and how to improve attractiveness of area studies classroom. On the fourth question, I think that with the interdisciplinary skills and ability to use local languages, area studies students have some more advantages than students of other disciplines in job market. When choosing the area studies major, students themselves are already oriented to work in the area they study, often outside of their home area. In addition, area studies uh, is a highly applicable field, so students uh, are more likely to work not only in academia. Even so, in the current globalized context, I think that area studies students should be better equipped with the following knowledge and skills. The first is language. In the past, academic institutions focused on teaching students the most related language of the area. For example, Japanese for Japan studies, Vietnamese for Vietnam studies. However, multilingualism is a defining characteristic of many areas, countries. 
The choice of which languages to teach students is often related to the assessment about the area and the faculty member capacities, expertise. Besides, to have students actively participate in international conferences, it is necessary to equip them with international languages. The balance between the proportions of foreign language subjects and specialized subjects between the first and the second foreign languages are key issues in developing area studies curriculums. I think that for area researchers, language is a vital tool for research, but not everything. Therefore, the second uh, is used is comprehensive knowledge, which helps students get a full understanding of uh, the research area. We can see that there are two approaches in training area study students. Uh, the first is from disciplinary to interdisciplinary, and the second is from interdisciplinary to disciplinary. The first approach can be found in traditional courses emphasizing language, culture, histories. Many courses of area studies today are still built uh, by uh, synthesizing many subjects in different specialties related to the uh, studied area. However, to help learners logically observe and relate uh, specialized knowledge to each other, it is important to incorporate an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach into the curriculum. For example, subject related geography to historical events or history to cultural heritages. In order to provide a comprehensive knowledge of the area, the second approach seems to be more suitable, but it is limited of the depth of knowledge and uh, methods of each uh, discipline. One way to overcome this is when building a graduate program with students taking a bachelor's course based on disciplinary approach, we can add uh, interdisciplinary knowledge and vice versa. For students make, uh, taking a bachelor course based on interdisciplinary approach, we can add a specialized knowledge in methods. Uh, the third is a research method. Uh, the common research methods applied uh, in area studies are case studies and comparative study. Besides, students need to be equipped with a number of specialized methods suitable or to their research topics. The fourth is field work skills. There are essential skills that need to be prepared prior to students feeling a trip into the area, uh, including uh, formulating questionnaires, interviewing, collecting, and analyzing information. A comprehensive knowledge of the area, a sociable and respectful attitude towards the local peoples will support the field work. The fifth is soft skills to study an area, collaboration among experts and people from many uh, fields and agencies is common. Therefore, see, uh, skills in teamwork, project management, critical thinking, ide uh, identify problems and propose uh, solutions are important skills. On the second questions, uh, I think that uh, the scope area in area studies is relative and flexible. Depending on the topic of study, the scope can be a continent, a country, or a locality. Thus, the area studies classroom itself is not confined to a particular area or country. Lecturers can provide students with vivid and rich research examples from a wide range uh, of areas. Besides, depending on the research uh, topic, uh, the, research, the area in scope can be studied more deeply in several uh, fields, providing many examples of area studies from different research perspectives help students appreciate the diversity of the research field and make area studies classes more appealing. Secondly, an important method of area studies is a case study. Uh, it also contributes uh, to the attractiveness and the depth of, of area studies. Case studies can provide an authentic and insightful look at the pupil and life in the area. 
Therefore, training students to practice uh, case studies combined with field work not only brings uh, excitement uh, to learners, but also improves uh, the quality of uh, research. A student exchange program study abroad uh, scholarships uh, create conditions uh, for students to practice these skills in the area. Third, thirdly, other research methods uh, of the area studies is the competitive study, i.e. placing the research subject in relation to other areas or within a wider area thereby highlighting as a specificity and universality of the studied area. Thus, the content of area studies lectures itself is international or more probably global. Engaging more international students to participate in area studies classes also plays an important role in enhancing the globality and quality of uh, the class. Uh, the area will be viewed more multidimensionally and objectively through exchanging opinions between students from many countries and areas, including uh, the area being studied. Classes that involve many international students also have students build an international network of cooperation that will support the job after graduation. Nowadays, it has been uh, become easier to organize online classes and seminars. So periodically organizing lectures and seminars with the participation of a professor, students from several institutions and several countries not only help students understand the research situations of the area in the world, but also contributes uh, to building a, local, a global uh, network of area studies. Uh, here are some photos and posters of our uh, university uh, activities. You can see in the left um, some poster of our joint project uh, with NUS with the support of the uh, Japan Foundation from this year. And in the right uh, hand, you can see us uh, that we are now planning uh, some uh, uh, project with the University of Tokyo for organizing uh, forums and seminars for young researchers. I hope that, that uh, with these activities, uh, we can build a wider network of area studies from now. Thank you for your attention. Uh, next, Dr. Alessio Patalano. He has founded uh, and been directing Japan program at the King's College, and he will give us his thoughts and uh, specific experiences on teaching future regional specialists and their careers. Okay, excellent. Um, um, Hazan, thank you kindly for the generous invitation and thank you very much to the Japan Foundation for the opportunity to organize this, this, this panel and do a bit of a, a, a temperature check, temperature check um, as to where we are with uh, um, area studies in general, in Japan studies in particular. Um, how uh, Japan studies is evolving to remain fit for purpose? That's one of the key questions. And, and I was very glad when I was asked to, to join the conversation today, uh, because that's, that's one of the fundamental questions that I've been grappling with um, since the establishment in 2015 of the uh, King's Japan program. Um, I have three points today that I want to discuss with you um, that sort of provide the, the backbone, uh, the framework for the answer to the essay question that we are given. First of all, I think it's very important to start with the context where you're teaching your university reality. And at King's, as you can see from the goals that we have um, here on the first slide, there is a strong sense that reflects three things. The first, we have about in the um, sort of um, high level of 60% of our students have a 
cosmopolitan background, they come from different places, they're all multilingual. But they don't come to an area studies department, they come to a place of learning that focuses on international politics, strategic studies, security studies, or military history. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the question there um, is on one hand, how do you make something like area studies that is not a natural port of call for this kind of students, something that is of interest to them, but above all, it in, sort of enriches their students' experience. And this links to the second element of this question of the context, and that is, um, in particular, a king's. Uh, we know that one of the college core elements is a, a vocational aspect to give something back to public service. Um, and a, a majority of our students actually come to King's with the intention to join some form of government department from wherever they are or indeed international organization. So the context there is one in which how do you create uh, an experience in which Area studies is part of a broader skill set that is engineered and geared towards not necessarily people that want to go into academia, but people that will be operating in an international uh, uh, sense. And this leads to my second point for today. Um, um, and uh, just to, to give you an idea, this is just the, the level of, of network of places where our students tend to go. Um, in fact, the problem with the slides is that we were given a, a limit of 100 different points of link, otherwise we would have gone beyond 250, but just to give you a sense of the exposure, both in terms of the link that we create through our students and how our existing research and education links overseas puts a spotlight for potential students to become interested in, in the organization. Um, so all this leads to, to the fundamental point that I think it was uh, uh, informing uh, my own approach to, to Japan studies into the specific context I'm talking about, the vision. And, and the vision for the Japan program was one of creating cultural competency uh, with the intent of enhancing strategic fluency. It's a very targeted type of experience, one in which the student that is coming to King's to learn about how to better get a, be prepared for a job in an international space, whether it is a department of government or a multinational organization, how can I help them developing uh, an expertise, a specialization that um, offers Japan as an opportunity to enhance uh, understanding of international politics, international security, or indeed of military and international studies. So really at heart, from a methodological point of view, was about um, integrating um, within different disciplines, which are not area studies, elements of area studies and, and, and area studies themes that are relevant to these disciplines, so to make the students' experience much more interesting and engaging. Now, even though my panel, this panel is, is, is about education, um, there is an element there that, that a, an institution like, like, like King's, education and research are, cannot be entirely divorced. Um, and partly because of the outcome of what we do is related also to impact, you have what I created there, what is a virtuous circle in which by using themes of area studies and explaining why they matter to the understanding of international politics, I am drawing also in the way to make my case on the, my own research that on one hand comes from area studies but seeks to inform a broader debate, a debate that is not purely academic but it has also policy implication, a point that we'll come back to in a minute. And education in that sense never stops just in your university context. Uh, King's is, is, is at the forefront of professional uh, development, particularly in, in the military. And that sort of interaction with different type of audiences, different type of constituencies, and this idea always to minding your context in order to tailor what elements of area studies might be relevant to that particular audience is one of the key elements that makes this idea of cultural competency, which basically is developing a bespoke capacity to enhance a student's learning experience, um, regardless of the type of audience that you have in, in front of you. That is at the heart of, of what we've been trying to do over the last seven years. Um, and we've tried to do it um, by uh, uh, 
changing the curriculum in two ways. One, we injected in a progressive fashion, but also self in a self-containing fashion, uh, the study of various studies at different levels of education. So midway into an undergraduate degree and then going into the last years uh, for a specialization, master's program, PhD, um, bespoke government related courses, as well as sort of uh, uh, engaging what we are trying to do in educational terms and um, sort of link it to the wider research agenda. That's one level. The other level is by creating also a student's experience in which the learning element is attached to the practical and transferable skills that might be of relevance once you get into the type of job that our students are pursuing. So in this respect, for example, dynamic learning through simulations, through targeted events, um, has been a very important element of the story. And this is something that I want to spend um, um, a bit of a moment here because I think it's one of the key elements in which you innovate um, area studies. So this is a small example for you, to, to give you an idea of, of how it comes all together. Um, so this is an example of a crisis that took place um, in June 2016. Um, that builds on part of a research project that at the time that I was conducting um, uh, 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 to understand the dynamics and the transformation of uh, Sino-Japanese maritime tensions around the Senkaku Islands, known in China as, as, as Diaoyu. Um, the reconstructions of the events and the analysis of the events, which was uh, 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 targeted to achieve two objectives. One, an academic publication, um, and one, a policy research project that was commissioned uh, by a uh, government, um, not a Japanese government. That enabled me to have a sufficient amount of materials to design a simulation crisis that then uh, was developed with uh, uh, fully brief for country briefs for groups that then would be role played by our students. And we ran the simulation for about three years. Um, until then, we changed and we focused on a different type of scenario. And all of the elements of the simulation were drawn from um, a series of events that either had taking place in relation to the same calculus or by a broader study and understanding of, of Chinese and Japanese maritime behavior in a broader East Asian context. And it became quite apparent, and perhaps today, in light of the recent events in Ukraine, is, is, is perhaps obvious, but it became quite apparent from the experience of running the simulation, the complexities of diplomatic negotiations, the complexities of time reaction, and how sort of any you know, actions don't take place ever in a vacuum, that other people have a vote. So that dynamic learning of things that you might think are reasonable, sensible, but in the context of unfolding events with different players, um, actually are not necessarily as much. That sort of understanding uh, became quite valuable. And one of the interesting things about this simulation in particular is that uh, some of the students there at the time took it when they went on to a different type of job. One of them in particular ended up working in the UK Parliament, brought that experience with her, and then raised it with the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And eventually, this week, we ran the first ever simulation for the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament. And, and part of the early conversations was really how that particular experience that came from area studies had enriched the students' sort of um, uh, uh, life at university, and that the student brought it with her as she ended up in a different type of job. Um, so what to say to conclude this? Um, there are, you know, metrics are always a, a relative sort of idea, but I think so far success in our case um, has been uh, proven by a number of different factors. Um, we've grown from something of four, like 49 students over two modules um, between a BA and MA to three modules and almost 140 students um, currently enrolled in our modules, which for a university of our size is quite a considerable number altogether. We've hosted more than 80 events, uh, for five international conferences, um, and we led professional developments in different countries, Japan, China, um, notably, um, Oman um, and other parts of the Gulf. Um, we enhanced the research element, um, but also in terms of policy impact. Um, the method that we uh, sort of we, we tested in class uh, did uh, leave some sort of an impact. Um, about um, a third of the students end up working in uh, UK, different UK government departments. Um, and and um, we've basically covered every single parliamentary inquiry on the Indo-Pacific since 2019. 
and we contributed to shape a part of the process around the defence and security review that was taking place in the UK um, last year. And, and eventually, um, I myself, I'm currently serving as a specialist advisor for the Indo-Pacific to the Foreign Affairs Committee. So, all together, um, we started with an idea which was about taking stock of the particular context, the function that the university plays in, uh, in our, sort of, if you want, in our public uh, space. And on the back of that, we tried to uh, create an environment in which students' experience was the ultimate goal and one that was targeted by creating a sufficient amount of cultural competency so that that competency would become um, an asset, a strategic asset, an asset of fluency that could be reused in a, in a sort of uh, 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 career working environment. On this happy note, stop here. My 10 minutes are done. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's hear from our last speaker of the educational panel, Dr. William Bridges, about his innovative uh, approach in teaching about Japan with uh, very wide perspectives. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. And thank you to all of my fellow panelists and their very compelling thoughts thus far. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for joining us here this evening. The fact that you are here with us rather than enjoying the Waikiki Beach is a testament to your commitment to the Japanese studies. So thank you so much for being with us here this evening. So we are here today in celebration of not only the work that the Japan Foundation has done over the past 50 years, but the work it will continue to do over the next 50 years and ideally beyond. So with that in mind, the motivating premise behind my thoughts today is this. What do we want Japan studies to look like in the year 2072? Now, I realize that when we quantify it in this way, a future 50 years away might feel too far removed from our contemporary moment and its crises to even be contemplated. But I want to suggest that we will be celebrating the centennial anniversary of the Japan Foundation much sooner than we anticipate. Indeed, there is some undergraduate studying Japanese studies with us today who very well may be providing their thoughts on the enduring importance of Japan studies and the Japan Foundation some 50 years from now. And so, to borrow the words of Jonas Salk, my motivating concern today is this. What does it mean to be a good ancestor? When we begin to imagine a hypothetical version of the celebration in the year 2072, what do we need to begin doing today to ensure that the future has more rather than less to celebrate than we do today? Now, when I ask myself this question, two things come immediately to mind. The first is that I want the study of Japan simply to be in the year 2072. That is to say, any number of intellectual fields have come and gone over the decades. And so it is no guarantee that Japan studies will ex still exist in the year 2072. And so if we want it to be for future generations, it is our obligation to perpetually reimagine its ongoing longevity, vitality, and existential importance for both the academy as well as the public good. The second thing that comes to mind is this. Although I want Japan studies to continue to be, uh, I don't think being is enough. Rather, I want it to be in its full plentitude, to flourish, to be in unexpected and surprising places and in ways unimaginable from our vantage point in the year 2022. I hear these two concerns, namely a commitment to the ongoing existence and flourishing of Japan studies in the very premise of the conversation to which the Japan Foundation has invited us today. Take, for example, that second question the Japan Foundation posed to the panelists. The question is to remind you, quote, how can area studies classrooms become more globalized and diversified, and thus more appealing to students as well as institutions, without compromising the depth and texture of studying a specific area or country? Now, before providing my response to how I think we might answer this question, I want to first highlight and expand a few of its terms. The first term I want us to consider is the reach of the audience to which Japan studies must appeal. 
As the question is currently articulated, our task is to imagine a Japan studies education that appeals to, quote, students as well as institutions, end quote. But remember, we're dreaming big here, right, of the year 2072 and beyond. And with the scope of this envisioning exercise in mind, I want to propose that we begin by expanding our vision of the appeal of an education in Japan studies. And I think we've seen a bit of that in our previous conversation. That is to say, let's imagine a Japan studies of more depth within institutions and more breadth beyond them. This would be a Japan studies with appeals to staff, administration, alumni, and so on within our institutions, as well as to public schools, community centers, libraries, museums, and so on beyond our institutions. In other words, the imagined audience for our ideal Japan studies in the future would be everyone. There would be no theoretical limit to whom our educational practices should appeal. Now, the second aspect of the question I want to highlight is its concern with, quote, compromising the depth and texture of studying a specific area, end quote. Now, I have been quite happily married for the last two decades, uh, so I like to think of myself as something of an expert on the topic of compromise. Now, I am aware that compromise is a term that we use for the deliberative exchange that characterizes relationships of reciprocity. I'm also aware, however, that the term compromised is used as it is used in the question to characterize a corrupted operative of an intelligence agency. Now, given the history of its intellectual formation, perhaps area studies is more comfortable with being on watch for that negative valence of a compromised intelligence than it is with encouraging that positive valence of relational exchange and reciprocity. It seems to me, however, that the future will need a Japan studies more open to compromise in that positive sense of the term. Now, here I have in mind the first half of the question the Japan Foundation posed. Namely, the first half of the question reads, quote, how can area studies classrooms become more globalized and diversified? Now, my fellow panelists have provided any number of compelling ideas as to how we might globalize and diversify the study of Japan. And with the space opened by their insights, I would like to take the liberty of turning this question upside down. In other words, rather than asking how we might globalize and diversify the study of Japan, I want to instead ask how we can globalize and diversify the entire university's curriculum by putting it into dialogue with Japan. Let's call the approach I have in mind Japanese studies across the curriculum. Now, this approach is modeled on the success of four languages across the curriculum programs. In foreign language across the curriculum programs, a given quote unquote content course in translation is supplemented by the study of primary documents in the original language. In a Japanese history course in translation, for example, students who study Japanese will meet for supplementary lessons in which pertinent Japanese documents are read, analyzed, and discussed. Now, the assumption of foreign languages across the curriculum program is that the study of a language should not be confined to the language classroom. Rather, languages should be alive in the curriculum, crossing preconceived curricular boundaries organically as opportunities and pedagogical connections arise. Now, for the sake of clarity, I should note that with Japanese studies across the curriculum, I am not calling for a one-to-one -one duplication of foreign languages across the curriculum for Japan studies. Rather, I am proposing that we consider what it might mean to imbue contemporary Japanese studies with the spirit of the foreign languages across the curriculum model. That is to say, what would our curriculum look like? How would it transform if we actively searched and cultivated spaces where Japan studies existed beyond the typical intellectual homes of Japan studies? In closing, let me provide a few examples of what I have in mind. In 2019, my colleagues at the University of Rochester and I hosted a lecture by Hiraoka Sakae, a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, we invited both the City of Rochester Public Library 
as well as the University of Rochester's physics department to collaborate with us in hosting this lecture. As a second example, I am currently teaching a course on hip hop in Japan. Now, I designed the course in dialogue with the director of the University of Rochester's Institute of African and African American Studies to ensure that this course in Japanese studies would count towards the completion of the major in African American studies. As a third example, my colleague David Holloway offered a course in modern Japanese literature at a state prison in upstate New York through the Rochester Educational Justice Initiative which provides education for incarcerated individuals toward the goal of an associate degree in liberal studies. In each of these examples, be it the collaboration between a Japanese program and the physics department, or the creation of a modern Japanese literature syllabus for imprisoned students, it is inevitable that compromises must be made in order to ensure that each interlocutor fully comprehends the importance and value of Japan studies. These compromises, however, are compromises in the best sense of the term, which allow Japan studies to appeal broadly and flourish in times and places beyond the preconceived limits of the curriculum and the boundaries of the university. Thank you. All excellent uh, uh, presentation, and especially uh, we had a very provocative questions posed by uh, Dr. Bridges' presentation just now. So uh, let's get into the sort of uh, you know discussion within the educational panel, and then uh, and then uh, research panel panelists can actually uh, you know more than happy to join. And uh, um, why why don't I why don't I actually to pose you the, the, the question that the, Dr. Bridges actually just uh, proposed. What can we do uh, as a group uh, ancestors for the, uh, for the Japan study specialists in the future? You know, as a Japanese organization uh, staff member, you know, we have to, uh, I have to kind of get prepared for the centennial uh, <laughs> event tomorrow. Um, so uh, I have to know that the, what, uh, what can we do um, or what the Khan Foundation do for that matter for uh, another 50 years and as a good ancestors now. Anybody, any thoughts? I have one just preliminary thought sure. that I will put on the table to give people a bit of time to gather their thoughts. Um, it seems to me that, and this is a part of what's in the background of my thoughts today, that a part of what we have to do is articulate the notion of studying Japan as a public good. Hmm. Right? And there are multiple ways in which the study of Japan is, a, is kind of a public good. However, given the uh, contemporary kind of logics and languages of the university, a public good tends to be kind of reduced or diluted down to kind of market metrics. Right? That is to say, uh, it's good insofar as there are a set of skills or there is a way that it is marketable or what have you. Um, and that, first and foremost, is certainly the case. Right? There is a way that a part of what the market is doing is trying to measure value for the public. And, right? So there's a part of what Japan Studies is doing. It gives us a kind of value that can be kind of then translated into a market sense of value. In addition to that, however, it seems to me that a part of what Japan Studies does is gives us new ways of imagining and understanding the world. Right? That is to say, it gives us a new set of intellectual metrics for understanding what is value. Right? And that new understanding of value is a part of what, at least in my mind, makes the humanities in general, uh, but Japanese studies in particular, uh, something that the public needs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more than one way to be in the world. And a part of what the study of Japan does is gives us a sense of some of those other ways of being. Uh, that expanded imagination uh, is profoundly good for the public in my mind. Mm -hmm. So really making the case for the goodness of Japan and Japanese studies that and again, keeps in mind that kind of that market-oriented language, but also transcends it and gives us other ways of kind of conceptualizing uh, notions of the public good is what a thing that I think is will be important for garnering more public support and then in turn kind of leading to the long-term longevity, if you'd like, of Japanese studies. Mm -hmm. 
Any other ideas? Yeah. If I may, um, two points here. So first of all, we're, we're, at any point in time, we're always someone else's ancestor. Right, I'm, I'm already starting to become the ancestor of my own students, which is a terrible thought because I thought I was very young until yesterday. Um, but but so, so there's always that. Um, and, and I think we need to keep in the back of our mind a space within which that if I actually have a clear imagination of where Japan studies is going to be in, in, in 50 years' time, I've already failed the Japan studies. Um, the future is about the stuff that we don't know. And in fact, all I, I, I want for my students is to be able to imagine their own future and me being wow when it comes about. So I think there is an element there that, that, that we can only guide insofar as we can see, but then the horizon also stretches far beyond that. And um, within this context, I think two, two, two things that I take away from the experience of the last 15 years of evolution of Japan studies. One, uh, Japan studies uh, is going to places where, it's going on a, on a Star Trek journey, if I could say. It's going to places where it hasn't been before. And in particular, sort of going beyond the area studies uh, departments and, and sort of the, the global trends that, that William captured, really important. Taking Japan studies into new realities in different disciplines, why Japan matters. It matters in all sorts of different ways. And taking that knowledge to people that wouldn't naturally be exposed. One of the most rewarding experiences of the last 10 years was one of my um, Chinese PLA students, a, a serving officer who was in the UK doing his PhD, uh, coming to one of my classes on, 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 on war and strategy in East Asia uh, during the sort of late 19th century, um, uh, came to me um, after my lecture on the first sign of Japanese war and, 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 and came to me very quietly and said, like, you know, you were talking about in class about this particular class of, of Japanese foreign policy and, and how there was a whole lot of debate. It's like, that's really not how we, we learn about Japan in the first sign of Japanese war. And so, is that a book I can read where I can find this? And I say, sure. And I gave him a, 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 you know, a bibliography of about 10 texts. He went away, came back to me about a month, and he disappeared. I didn't see him in class for, for about a month until he came back. And it's like, wow, I had no idea that there was a, such a debate in Japanese uh, uh, diplomacy. As a small example, that is a place whereby that particular person would have never been exposed mm -hmm. unless Japan studies was nested into mm -hmm. a different discipline, which was his first interest. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think taking Japan to new places is the first point. And the second one, there are metrics. I, I think one of the other experiences that I take away from um, the past few years is how the example that I used about the simulation that, that, that brought about a debate in a different place that I had nothing to do with, but it rewarded the effort in, 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 in the first place and create a specific area of deliverable that has relevance. Again, the context matters. In, in my particular sort of uh, uh, university space, a lot of what we do is geared towards giving something back to the public, whether it is people that join the civil service or indeed influencing policy space. Taking Japan studies into a realm beyond academia that has a practical relevance, that helps shaping the deliverables of national policy, I think that is a lasting legacy. Mm -hmm. One that is less direct of the work that we do as academics, but nonetheless very important for the very point that William was making about how to create a lasting legacy of the discipline that doesn't die. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, taking it to new places, to places where the deliverables become a common good that people can see beyond the walls of university. I think these are two important places that in 50 years time, someone else will have reconceptualized completely differently. I'm gonna be very happy not to have any idea or clue why it came to be. All right, thank you. Can I respond sure, very sure. quickly to the ideas? There's so many brilliant ideas in there. And I think that we are 99% in agreement. So I just kind of wanted to go back and clean up one of those points. Uh, the first thing to note is I take your point about the notion of a singular fixed future and that being not the objective, right? That is the same thinking in particular of the research of a psychologist by the name of Philip Tetlock, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, who's done work on forecasting and its accuracy. And one thing that he's found is that if we are trying to forecast a singular accurate future, uh, the most our time frame can be is about two years. Uh, once we move beyond that two year period, the quote unquote accuracy of a, the attempt to predict a singular future drops off precipitously. So the idea that we would focus on one singular future and try to predict it with accuracy, I agree, that very much would be the death of, that might be the answer <laughs> to that question of the death of Japan studies. So I certainly take that point. Um, 
One thing I do want to push back on, however, is if we are very clear about what we mean when we say imagining possible futures. That is to say, we are not trying to predict one singular entity that will be and never change. Instead, we have an ensemble forecasting is the term that's typically used. That is to say, we have a multiplicity of scenarios, uh, some of them expected, some of them unanticipated, uh, some of them seemingly unimaginable that kind of push the boundaries of what we would typically suggest. Uh, so we have this multiple set of possibilities of what might come to be, and we begin to do the work today to move towards those, and a part of what that work entails, and now I think we come much closer to agreement, would be the constant uh, reassessment of the vision, right? So that's to say the vision that we have today should not be the vision that we have tomorrow, mm -hmm. that we would continue to do that kind of rethinking. Uh, that, it seems to be, is imperative. If we are serious about creating a Japan studies that will last the test of time, uh, there are things that we need to start doing today <laughs> in order to, to, to the obvious example is climate change as an analogy. There are certain things that we need to do today, and there are certain things that futurists would refer to as future fossils. That is to say, by virtue of its existence in the present, we can anticipate its existence in the future. Uh, there are those kind of things that, for which we can account. Right? And if we keep those things in mind as we begin to reimagine on a daily basis the possibilities of Japan studies, it seems to me that that thought exercise um, will be imperative, that keeping the status quo is, moves us like something towards the death knell uh, of Japan studies. And that was in the background of those thoughts. Uh, but I think that we have probably talked too much, so no, should okay. we open it to the audience? Well, I mean, the, uh, so, the, the, the one thing I learned is that we don't have to, or, or we shouldn't have a preconceived notion of a future Keynes and a future Vogels yet. And as, uh, as the future Japan specialists would have a completely different, uh, uh, which is not really good or bad, but a different sort of a, uh, academic orientation and, uh, and a track records for that matter. So with that, I'm gonna move on to the uh, next panel uh, on research. and. Uh, the, the, the specific questions for the panelists are like these. Can we have uh, uh, two questions for the research panel? Yes. Uh, first, Dr. Margarita Long, or Mimi Long, as we all know her, uh, gave us her insights drawn from running a new program on environmental humanities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harasan. It's a pleasure to be here celebrating the Japan Foundation's 50th anniversary. Um, I'm the principal investigator on the Japan Foundation Institutional Support Grant in Environmental Humanities at the University of California, Irvine. And I'm joining our plenary to introduce the research made possible by this generous support. Uh, first, however, I would like to frame my remarks by taking gentle issue with our title and inviting our colleagues um, <laughs> from Singapore, the UK, and the US to address it as well, if they like. Um, so our focus is the current state and the future prospects of area studies. And our title is Strengthening Human Capital Pipelines. Now in a planning meeting recently, I asked our host Harasang if it were possible to change the title to something like Evolving Area Studies for a Robust Future or New Disciplinary Commitments for an Old Field. But he replied that forces more powerful than those on our panel had conspired to make this, this title permanent. However, it seems to me that the problem with human capital pipelines is that it echoes the idea widely criticized in the humanities in Japan and in the US and elsewhere, just mentioned by Will, that the era of the public university is over and the only way to run institutions of higher learning is as businesses. Nevertheless, if we want to attract young people to academia, I think that we need to acknowledge that what they crave is an alternative to corporate metrics. They want to be not human resources, but actually human, not in a pipeline, but free to imagine alternatives, for instance, to the fossil fuel imperatives increasingly challenged very bravely in places like Standing Rock, North Dakota. To attract promising thinkers to our degree programs, we need to emphasize the university's unique mission, threatened but still alive, of fostering work that is impossible to capture in the language of market-oriented managerialism. Um, now, with reference to the University of California system where I work, uh, Christopher Newfield and Wendy Brown have both argued that what we lose when we cede the university to privatization and business school metrics uh, are the conditions for democracy itself. Um, so the stakes are high. 
And I would also note that the cash nexus, or what Marx called the subsumption of all existence, environmental, animal, human, into a capitalist economy is the major cause of our current environmental crisis. So this is another reason to avoid terms like human capital pipelines in favor of terms like new disciplines and evolving commitments. Now, on the topic of disciplines and commitments, one book that I've always admired is Gayatri Spivak's Death of a Discipline, about the role that area studies could and should play when world literature, I'm, I'm a literature person, increasingly ignores geopolitical specificity to impose what she calls the tyranny of global English. Spivak argues that without the support of the humanities, area studies has quality and it has rigor, but it has, quote, conservative or no politics. In turn, without area studies, Spivak says her field, comparative literature, reads texts well and reads power well, but remains hopelessly Eurocentric. So the discipline whose death her book title invokes is just the old comparative literature. And in its place, Spivak calls for a discipline that can do both languages and geopolitical rigor, like area studies, and theory, politics, and race, like comp lit. 20 years after the publication of her book, amidst political and environmental emergencies driving our most serious students to movements like Black Lives Matter and Sunrise, it seems more clear than ever that area studies needs politics, needs theory, needs invested close readings of power. So how do we make this happen? I'd like to briefly sketch our attempt at UC Irvine. And I have six lightning points, because we're supposed to do lightning presentations, uh, which I'm gonna frame as six imperatives in the imperative voice in an attempt to strike a kind of do-it-yourself chord and inspire other people to apply for these generous Japan Foundation institutional grants. Point one, choose a topic with global relevance. Japanese environmental humanities disinherits the truism that we need East Asian studies because there are certain things the world can only learn from East Asia. Instead, it uses the area studies umbrella to address problem, a problem that's not unique to Japan, but that's uniquely approachable by means of Japanese studies interdisciplinarity. Literature, history, visual studies, anthropology, political science, and religious studies all come to climate crisis from different angles. By combining their insights, we aim to inherit the wisdom of classic Gemba studies, of Ashio, of colonial Hyongnam, of Minamata, of Fukushima, while also discovering new Gemba, new sites where the material world intrudes on human culture and forces innovation. Point two, prioritize grad graduate students. The grant, our, our grant funded three international symposia and we used the year one budget to bring 20 um, US and international students to a place called the U University of California Desert Research Center for a graduate conference and three master classes. Compared to already employed professors like us, grads are more open to new approaches and more committed to intellectual relevance. Three days of hiking, making meals, and presenting work nurtured a cohort that we hope will stay in touch and grow the field. Point three, hire someone inspiring. Our grant came with seed funding for an assistant professor in Japanese environmental humanities, and we were lucky to hire John Pitt, a pioneer in critical plant studies. I'll never forget John's job talk dinner where he casually produced a set of syllabi that showed how Japanese literature studies can move enigmatic figures like Imanishi Kinji and Minakata Kumagusu to center stage, and also open startling new readings of canonical figures like Hayashi Fumiko, Kaiko Takeshi, and Abe Kobo. John started at UCI in 2020, and his graduate and undergraduate seminars have been waitlist only, with students from across the humanities, not just East Asian studies. He's in high demand as a podcaster. Oops. Oh, I have... Oh, this is an earlier version. I'm so sorry. Okay. He's in high demand as a podcaster, a speaker, a translator, and I couldn't be more excited about his forthcoming book, Becoming Botanical. Point number four. Build an international exchange. Um, at UCI, we're preparing an application to the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership uh, for a project called Green Japan Exchange um, for US and Japan-based undergraduates to earn a certificate in environmental humanities while studying abroad. We want to collaborate on the one hand with the University of California system-wide education abroad program and the 10 Japanese universities to and from which it sends and receives students. And on the other hand, with UCI's Global Sustainability Resource Center, which runs a campus-wide minor in environmental studies, several clubs and internship programs, and an annual student institute for sustainability leadership retreat. 
It's an ambitious plan, but it has great potential to build environmental activist-based collaborations between faculty and undergraduates in the US and Japan. Five, network with other scholarly groups. While the Japan Foundation Institutional Grant provides funding for three or four years, it can also help sustain longer-term scholarly projects. For our year two international symposium, UCI joined forces with something called the Trans-Pacific Workshop, a group convened in 2015 to discuss war, empire, race, labor, and the intensification of right-wing nationalisms. This is an annual gathering on the US side of faculty and grads in Southern California, and on the Japan side of faculty from Tsuda College, Nihon University, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, Waseda, Musashi University, Meiji Gakuin, and Japan Women's University. Having organized symposia on the topics of appropriation, wound, thanato politics, and precarity, we chose the topic dirt for 2020. And we were eager to, eager to debate whether a concept like tsuchi, or dirt, or soil, inevitably defaults into blood and soil type essentialisms, or whether, as argued in recent and not so recent books by Mark Triscoll, and here I wish I had my slides, but Mark Triscoll, Clinton Goddard, Christine Marin, and Suzuki Sadami, the politics of life, nature, and vitalism are ready for reassessment. Point six, last point, have fun. Needless to say, our 2020 DIRT Symposium got canceled by COVID. After uh, my colleagues John Pitt and David Fedman used the year three symposium to host a really amazing fall 2021 event called Alpine Archipelago, surveying Japan from the timberline, it was tempting to forfeit the year two budget and rest on our laurels. But in the process of writing a book about, uh, of writing about Tsushima Yuko for the concluding chapter of my own in-process book on Fukushima literature and activist narratives, I got too excited not to ask for a carryover to year four and a conference called Writers Who Have Seen Too Much, Anthropocene, Feminism, Japan. Next month, the UCI will issue a call for papers for an October 2022 celebration of Tsushima, Chiri Yukie, Saki Yamatami, Ishimure Michiko, and Kobayashi Erika. I have high hopes that this will be one of the funnest events in my career, and I hope I'll see many of you at this conference in October. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Tan Lan Lan from National University of Singapore, who is going to share with us the art of connecting the dots and creating the network of scholars across countries. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you, Hara-san. And congratulations to Japan Foundation for your 50th anniversary. Where is the clicker? <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm going to speak from um, using references, um, case references from Southeast Asia for this discussion. So if we look at the um, paradigm shift, using the paradigm shift framework in the study of Japan, um, we know that, it's, you know, we've started with this idea of um, Japanology, where Japan is seen as um, exotic. Uh, moving on to Japanese studies, which is an era of uh, learning from Japan, where um, Vogue's 1979 book, Japan is Number One, um, started the whole excitement, um, a very positive views of Japan. And then um, when it moves on gradually to contemporary um, paradigm, where it's more of um, conflict and tensions and alert and attention of diversity in gender, in race, in class, and so forth. Um, and now we're probably, well, I think trans-Japan is probably part of this contemporary perspective um, that develops, where we have more of um, um, ideas of not just looking at Japan, but out Japan, outside Japan, and the comparative regionalism, um, comparisons in Japan and also multidisciplinarity. I think there are various examples that we can find um, in the recent publications, one of which is uh, Sugimoto's book and Okano's book on rethinking Japanese um, studies, where they talk about um, how we should be moving away from um, the Eurocentrism to um, polycentrism and so forth. So, so basically things are developing um, as we look back, um, and like um, our fellow panel speakers, I grew up as um, 
Singapore local study in Japanese studies in the 1980s when it was the um, peak of the Learn from Japan um, craze. So the, if we look at where Department of Japanese Studies as a case reference here from National University of Singapore, NUS stands, we were established in 1981. So it was where the Japanese Studies um, paradigm started. And um, at that time, our premier then, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, was very keen to, um, to set up an institution to learn about Japan and um, his idea was to have locals to have the knowledge and skills to know about Japan and to, um, to fathom Japan so that we can know, you know why, how to learn to be as successful as Japan economically. So I think if you look at that sense, um, really this human capital pipelines, I think was already in the mind of our, <laughs> our politicians at that time. Um, but after that, I think as um, you know, that's more um, with the recession and in the late 1990s, we see um, much more keen interest in learning Japan uh, because of popular culture, not because they want to get a job in the Japanese companies. Um, I think um, this whole human capital pipeline idea kind of you know, declined a little bit where uh, we find that our students sometimes really enjoy the space of doing what they really love. You know, so we do have students who uh, major in chemistry that's coming to become our Japanese studies major as well. So if you look at the offering that we have this semester, I'm sorry, it's overlapping into education. <laughs> um, there are um, five modules in this um, in this academic year that relates to the trans-Japan ideas of you know, learning both Japan and another country. Um, so there's one in Singapore and Japan as well, and then also um, Japan and Korea. So in fact, when we talk about trans-Japan, it quite usually we look at Japan and, Asia, and other parts of Asia. Um, but the Japan and Korea modules here are in fact two new modules are only, uh, that are only starting to be offered this semester, and they are both by junior faculty. So it also shows how much you know, that trans-Japan kind of idea has been seeping in all these years. Okay, and then the other thing I think is interesting when we look at Japan outside Japan is um, also about understanding Japan and local interaction. So I talk about the Japan and Singapore module, and these are the pictures um, relating to it, where we brought students to field trips in Singapore. Uh, and this is the uh, Japanese cemetery in Singapore, which is the biggest in Southeast Asia. And it has some tombstones from as early as um, before the 20th century of the um, Karayuki-san as well. So, um, and our faculties are mostly from, um, we have Two thirds of our faculties are from overseas, and for all of us, um, we actually all started with just looking at Japan, and over time, becoming interested in the local perspective and local interaction um, that Japan has with the area of interest. So we have our colleagues looking at Japanese pop culture in Singapore, or Japanese theater in Singapore, businesses, history, and so forth. And this is just um, another example of the whole revisiting of, of um, history, Japan's restoration. And I thought this is very interesting, um, just for information, where uh, my colleague, um, Timothy Amis um, and Akiko Ishii, just got the um, book out from a conference. Um, also, um, we're glad that it's supported much by Japan Foundation to look at um, the um, how we can look at um, Meiji restoration differently. So they look at people, you know, engaging people who are working not on Japan, but on Asian history, engaging with um, those who are working on alternative histories in early modern Japan, as well as um, scholars that are in history in other um, disciplines that have nothing to do with history uh, of Japan, but um, can also see themselves as being impacted and informed by all this um, the Meiji Restoration. So I think this is also another example of the trans-Japan kind of framework that we're moving into. So the other um, initiative um, 
example that I like to bring out is that of a ground up initiatives of the setting up of Japanese Studies Association in Southeast Asia. This is really a very loose network that we, um, a group of Japanese studies scholars in Southeast Asia decided to come together for it. Um, before that, we are you know, usually looking at our relationship of, um, with Japan scholars, with North American scholars, but we, in fact, seldom look around us to see you know, what are the kinds of um, network and um, learning that we can have from each other. So that was um, really a ground up initiative that started from um, international relations scholars. So we are glad that um, we had Japan Foundation to support this. Uh, and the interesting thing about this conference is it's always held in a different place in Southeast Asia. So we really welcome our um, scholars from other parts of the world to join us as well. And last year, uh, we, are, we are supposed to have the last one in 2020, December in Laos. Um, but as you know, Laos are not, is not so developed in Japanese studies, so we in fact um, did not have much in, um, relationship with Laos, and we had the help of Japan Foundation um, to link us up with the National University of Laos. But well, because of COVID, so um, we changed we changed the whole thing online. So um, for the support of Japanese studies in Southeast Asia, besides Japan Foundation, we also have. Um, other corporate foundation. And it's interesting that um, in 2005, when we were looking into um, celebrating 25th anniversary of um, Japanese studies in NUS, we decided that um, we should look for funding to develop Japanese studies in Southeast Asia. So we were able to commit the funding and um, set up the program where, pro where it provides a lot of support for the networking within South, Southeast Asia. Um, so um, Hailin just now talked about the um, Vietnam National University students having a few work program with us. Uh, that was in 2015 where our students joined their students to go to Hoi An to look at the pre-war um, pre community, Japanese community in the Hoi An area. Yeah, so I think um, networking and collaboration is, is not um, uncommon. We do see quite a lot happening with Southeast Asia in the recent years. For example, the most recent one before the COVID was the Japan-Japanese Studies through a Southeast Asian lens that was organized by University of Hawaii Center for Japanese Studies. So um, I think moving on, well, we are welcoming post-COVID times, so I hope that there will be a lot more networking and collaboration as we shape the future together. So um, moving forward, I think um, another area that uh, we are hoping to do more is to really intensify more of the interaction between Japanese studies in Japan and outside Japan. As we know, in the recent years, there have been quite a few Japanese studies, global Japanese studies that was formed in Japan. and. Um, Perhaps other universities are already doing a lot of interaction with them, but um, for, for us at NUS, um, I think we're still um, hoping to have more um, connections um, so that it also um, benefit our students. And um, one of the, some of the ideas we have is to have a joint um, cross-regional PhD program partnership that we are exploring with a Japanese university and uh, perhaps a North American university so that our scholars, uh, the PhD st scholars could come up um, having a much more wider um, inclusive kind of perceptions on Japan, um, Japan scholarship. And we are also exploring the, um, a trans-Japan, the title would have trans-Japan and more <laughs> in a graduate program that we're still in the process of uh, thinking through. And, I, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to join this panel because I really learned a lot from fellow panelists on their experiences in setting up um, programs on new Japanese studies. So um, I will end up here and yeah, I'm looking forward to hear from the next speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we have Dr. Simon Kenner from the University of East Anglia. He's going to talk about his innovative approach to research collaboration on Japan and beyond. 
using digital technologies. Aloha. Good afternoon, everybody. President Umemoto Harasan. Well, William S. Clark said it pretty well, didn't he? Be ambitious. That surely is where the future of Japanese studies lies. Um, I'm an archaeologist. I spend most of my time looking at the ancient past, and it is a rare privilege and opportunity to look forwards. Um, I have to say that uh, Will stole a little of my thunder because I was going to say, where are we? How good are archaeologists going to be in predicting where we're going to be in 2072? So looking back from that, uh, from that, from that vantage point. My question in there, because all archaeologists love to formulate research questions, is uh, how does an understanding of Japan help us to understand what it will mean to be human as global citizens in the later 21st century. And I think that is where I start with this. And this is perhaps one of the questions that we've been tackling um, through my work at the Sainsbury Institute for the study of Japanese arts and cultures and for over the last 20 years and over the last 10 years at our Centre for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia. And there's some of the books that we've been putting out and various projects that we've been working on. Here we are. So the Sainsbury Institute was established uh, through philanthropic generosity by Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury uh, just over 20 years ago. And our mission is to promote world-class research and to be a leader in the study of Japanese arts and cultures from the past to the present. And uh, we've just meet, come across our 20th anniversary, so we've been doing some work to look where we're going to be over the next 20 years as well. We have four main research strands that we structure our activities around. They are my own area of archaeology and cultural heritage. We have specialists in contemporary Japanese visual culture, including manga and anime. We do art history and we have a big strand on digital Japan. And I know one of the themes we have asked to address this afternoon is how can the digital transformation relate to where we expect Japanese studies to be? And I have some case studies to give you in just a couple of minutes on that. However, the other half of my job with the Centre for Japanese Studies um, is working with colleagues across all of their disciplinary specialisations, including history, international relations, politics, literature, film studies, economics, pharmacy, and health studies. And I tell you, when you try to put together an interdisciplinary workshop that weaves all of those strands together, um, we all come away feeling greatly rejuvenated and uh, fascinated by the various link directions that that takes us in. Most recently, over the last two years, we've launched a new master's program in interdisciplinary Japanese studies. Now, this somewhat controversially is directed at students who may not have any specialization in Japanese language. In fact, may have no Japanese language at all. But we've all been hugely impressed by the research outputs that they have generated through their dissertations and research subjects that they've been addressing. So I think there's a, another conversation to be had um, around the future of Japanese language and how significant that is in Japanese studies, especially in the age of machine translation and AI, all of these things that are coming very rapidly down the tracks towards us. At the University of East Anglia, we're very proud now to host Japan Forum, which I think is the premier journal in Japanese studies produced from the UK. Um, we also, I'm on the editorial panel of something called the Japanese Journal of Archaeology, an online peer-reviewed English language journal produced by the Japanese Archaeological Association. And we also edit this new journal called New Area Studies, which is realigning what area studies is all about. And with um, some apologies to our first speaker, there is, I, uh, I would argue, a strong feeling in particular in the humanities and the social sciences that area studies needs to 
build on its foundations in strategic studies, but to move in new directions away from that as well, and that's what New Area Studies is trying to do. From a UK perspective, we are incredibly constrained by this thing called the Research Excellence Framework, which assesses the research outputs of all UK universities once every seven years. This comprehensive and exhausting process has just been completed um, in the latest round, and we're all expecting results in spring 2022. And these results will determine how much research funding is made to different universities on the basis of that. Again, it's something we could go into great detail about. But my point here is I think it would be tremendously useful for students looking to go into Japanese studies to have a history of what the Japan Foundation have achieved over the last 50 years. And so to be able to build on those firm foundations um, the future directions we want to be moving in. People have often said to me, ah, oh, why do you only do Japan? Surely Japanese studies in terminal terminal decline, everybody only wants to do China or other parts of the world. Okay, we hosted the Japan, Japan, Japanese Studies Postgraduate Workshop um, last month, organized by the Japan Foundation's London office and the British Association for Japanese Studies. We welcomed over 90 postgraduate students, PhD students in the main, to our university. They only had five minutes each to speak. I feel very privileged I've got seven minutes to speak today. I was hugely impressed by the range, breadth, and I took from that meeting that Japanese studies is in a very, very healthy state, somewhat strangely, given that one of the biggest issues being addressed was that none of these students have been able to get to Japan for the last two years. And I feel I must take this opportunity, because um, I think I'll be letting down all of my colleagues in the UK and all these students, to please urge the Japan Foundation to do whatever it can to facilitate the very rapid um, entry into Japan, not only of Japan Foundation fellows, but of the nearly half million students around the world and young researchers who want to be studying Japan. Please, let's get that done. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about reaching out to other parts of the world to do new research and what one can do with the digital term. We've been running Japanese studies summer schools at the University of East Anglia and the Saint Institute since 2014. The first was called Japan Orientation. It was particularly directed at students from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, including Ukraine. We had to move all of this online in summer 2020 um, at very short notice, and we just took the decision that we would try it out. And we moved from welcoming 15 students to join us for two weeks in Norwich to having over 350 students from all around the world in particular from the Global South. We weren't able to invite them all to submit graduation theses, but we did ask them all to prepare a two-minute Pecha Kucha-style presentation on their research interests, which they all did. It was one of the most interesting weekends that I've spent in the last 20 years, being blown away by the range and determination that these students sitting in their rooms from Calcutta to Buenos Aires to Cape Town with their fascination with Japan. And we've heard about a need to be developing Japanese studies of public good. There is a huge desire out there uh, for people to engage with Japanese studies. One of the questions we were asked to address was about how to facilitate further international collaboration. And my approach to this has been through comparative projects. And I'm just going to introduce a couple of those now. One of them involved the world's first twinning of archaeological sites. These are Neolithic sites about 5,000 years old in rural parts of England and Japan, where school children were involved in raising their own funding to uh, arrange bilateral visits between these two communities um, in rural Norfolk and in the central Nagano prefecture. And on the basis of this, we've been able to bring in top-notch researchers from both countries um, who have been delighted to be engaging with um, these broad audiences. This is what I recon as recognize as research with impact. We've already heard a little bit about that. 
This September, we open a brand new exhibition at Stonehenge, that very famous prehistoric site down in the southwest of England. Last year, Japan, uh, UNESCO um, inscribed 17 prehistoric Japanese sites as World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage. And we are in a, at Stonehenge. We're delighted to be able to introduce these Jomon stone circles, which nobody knows about. This has given rise to a new research project where we've been able, to, for the first time, to engage mainstream <laughs> British archaeologists in what is happening with Japan and vice versa. Digital, 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 digital. We can't <laughs> do enough digital. Please, 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 Japan, make more resources available digitally. We've all learned so much over lockdown. The only resources my students will now look at are online. Unfortunately, there's hardly anything available in art history, online, archaeology. There is a little bit more now, and there's a fine example here with the NARA National Institute for Cultural Properties and their massive database project where they now have, I believe, about uh, well over 100,000 archaeological reports have been digitized. But getting students engaged in the digital processes is a very clever way of getting them interested in the materials they're actually working with. And the dogu figure you see going around there was generated. It's a model of a dogu, most famous one that I bought a few years ago. This was all done through crowdsourcing. Over 100 people helped digitize that model, again, from all around the world. And lastly, we are now engaged in a new initiative called Nara to Norwich, Art and Belief at the Ends of the Silk Roads, through which we're examining similar processes whereby Buddhism is introduced to the Japanese archipelago and Christianity is introduced around the North Sea. And again, by making the processes familiar to our local audiences at both ends of Eurasia and picking up various interest groups along the way, we feel we're making a new contribution to understanding Japan in its global context, and we have an online exhibition which launches in the middle of April. We'll be showcasing some of that thought. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the Japan Foundation, on behalf of all of us, I think, for 50 years of the most amazing support, without which we wouldn't be able to do many of the things that we do do. So, <laughs> and uh, we hope that you'll be celebrated with a big cake when you get back to Japan. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We are already running out of time, but uh, do, do you have anyone have any sort of uh, final comments? That'd be all right. Uh, the Dr. Williams uh, pointed out that the uh, the point that the, the, the word compromise. And uh, I, before coming over here, I had this kind of wrong image. I realized I, I had this wrong Im idea of uh, uh, globalizing Japan studies, almost as if like uh, the attention would had to kind of uh, kind of steer away from Japan to some other countries or some other disciplines, and by and then thus thinning thinning the Japan studies as we know it. But the, uh, today, I realize that uh, it's the other way around. Uh, kind of trying to globalize in Japan is uh, trying to identify the different entries to Japan uh, and uh, using a sort of a global uh, sort of a framework to get more attention to Japan. And so uh, thank you for uh, changing my sort of uh, uh, ideas about the globalizing Japan today. And uh, that was my biggest takeaway today. Thank you so much. And uh, please join me, give a big applause to, the, to today's panelists. And uh, thank you so much for coming over tonight. And then uh, we have uh, uh, the Japan Foundation reception at uh, Hilton uh, uh, Hawaiian Village from 7.30. Thank you so much.